Well, welcome back to another episode of Finance Uncut. On today's episode, we're going to have a look at an article that discusses that we're still in the GFC. And as a reminder, next week I'm going to release a two part video called My Investment Thesis. In this video, I'm going to go into detail about my macro outlook and how I'm building up my portfolio for that outlook. So stay tuned next week, Monday and Wednesday, two part video. So I wanted to share this article from Zero Hedge, The Global Financial Crisis, 2007 to 2031. I thought this was a really good one to share and do a video. A short rant about how financial uncertainty will continue for years due to the consequences of the ongoing global financial crisis that began in 2007. In light of more important news yesterday, it's worth starting with Lord Mervyn King's contribution in monetary theory carried in the Financial Times this morning, equilibrating central banking with Maradona. Maradona ran 60 yards from inside his own half, beating five players before placing the ball in the English goal. The really remarkable thing, however, is that Maradona ran virtually in a straight line. How can you beat five players by running in a straight line? The answer is that the English defenders reacted to what they expected Maradona to do. Because they expected Maradona to move left or right, he was able to go straight on. Monetary policy works in a similar way. Market interest rates react to what the central bank is expected to do. In recent years, the Bank of England and other central banks have experienced periods in which they have been able to influence the path of the economy without making large moves in official interest rates. They headed in a straight line for their goals. How is this possible? because financial markets did not expect interest rates to remain constant. They expected that rates would move either up or down. Those expectations were sufficient at times to stabilise private spending while official interest rates, in fact, move very little. How the world changes. There is lots of earnest gabble on the wires this morning about how the appointment of Janet Yellen to run the US Treasury will change the relationship between central banks and governments forever that the independence of central bankers may forever be tarnished. The world will change. That is nailed on. It's clear that the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2031 is not nearly over. Current sickness crash of 2020 to 2022 will prove deep and crushing and is another spinner thrown into the freaking engine of Western capitalism. I think they mean crony capitalism, corporatism. Yesterday, UK Chancellor Sunak did his Dr. Chris Whitty impersonation, warning of 2.6 million unemployed if the economy behaves as expected. If we don't all sacrifice Christmas, it will be even higher. He pulled out some of the usual graphs to show everyone in the UK will have lost their jobs by mid-Feb unless we leave Granny on her own over the holiday. Given the government's uh, predilection for scaring the crap out of us, and sober macroeconomists who reckon unemployment may only hit 5.4%, it's entirely possible the UK economy will cruise out of COVID in April, bruised, battered, dented, only in need of some basic body work. Running an economy is not like balancing a household budget. It's more like running a car. Every so often something breaks and you need to fix it. Whatever it takes and however much it costs. Sometimes that means borrowing money. Government with monetary sovereignty, sovereignty have the ability to borrow as much money as they need by printing it. The dangers of monetary expansion on confidence and inflation are widely cited by the market orthodoxy as deadly and dangerous. But we now live in a different world. To understand why, go back to the start of the crisis in 2007. When a couple of small structured bond funds wobbled, first few pebbles rolling down the hill. These dislodged the larger stones that closed the money markets and triggered the panic and the run on names like Northern Croc, which crushed bond market liquidity. When the boulders started crashing down the hills as Bear, then Lehman went to wall or went to the wall, AIG effectively failed. The Western banking system stood on the brink of Armageddon. Ah, happy times. And a crack force of bankers, politicians, and accountants reinvented finance in the same old way. 
They applied sticky backed plastic, sealing wax and string to stabilize the mechanisms of finance. Stock markets collapsing, barred out banks, restored liquidity, dropped interest rates and did all kinds of clever things like quantitative easing, keep the creaking global economy turning. But there have been massive consequences, and these will likely be the theme of the second half of the GFC, which will impact us all in coming years. How do you unwind the distortions of the last 12 years? These include the pernicious effects of ultra-low rates, massive stagflation in financial assets, massively higher prices and minimal yields, lower yield for more risk, and the very real long-term disincentives of zero interest rates on growth, investment and business innovation and evolution. 2008 central banks save capitalism by completely undermining it. Challenges to restore it. We also see behavioural effects that stem from the consequences of dealing with the crisis. When bonds return nothing, risks are so high. Conventional assets promise nothing. People start to believe in fantabulous perpetual motion machines that will deliver unreal returns. Hence the stellar valuations of unicorns, imaginary crypto treasure, other mythical beats. When returns are so low, management goals change, which is why we've seen such a large portion of the last decade's corporate profits squandered and companies leverage themselves up on debt, both done to finance stock buybacks, pushing up managerial rewards. It has made good companies go bad. Look at Boeing as a prime example of a firm that effectively destroyed itself from the top. And then there is the fact that inflated financial assets put most of the central bank created wealth into the hands of a tiny number of asset owners. All that money that governments and central banks have been printing pushed up bond and equity prices, meaning it has gone straight into the hands of the already tremendously wealthy, while the middle class and poor suffered austerity. The top 1% have become obscenely rich. Wonder concerns on wealth and equality have gone through the roof. The challenge in the next 10 years will be unwinding all these effects. If you were to simply unwind QE, raise rates, the result will be the most utter and complete market wipeout of all time. It will destroy investment savings, markets, and collapse nations as confidence in fiat money government debt evaporates. Which is why markets believe central banks and governments will remain complicit together to keep markets stable by more distortions, bailouts, low rates, and QE infinity. Right for markets, how long? Only in the short term. Without the discipline, the invisible hand and ability of over-levered companies to fail, and the frisson that creates in opening new business niches, the new nimbler companies, then economies will fall into the same kind of Lethargy, the globe experienced in the Dark Ages, when government granted monopolies, stunted growth and invention, which means the West falls and China wins. Yep, this global financial crisis of 2007 to 2031 continues. How do we get out of this one? And uh, I just wanted to uh, add to this, I watched a video yesterday of uh, Rao Pal, uh, macro investor, and uh, and he was saying that uh, the trouble that we're in, especially with uh, the baby boomer generation retiring, the liabilities that governments have for pensions and whatnot, uh, unfunded liabilities, mind you, uh, how this is all going to play out and how this uh, transfer between uh, those with the wealth those without the wealth, uh, to, to close this wealth inequality gap, how this is all going to play out. Um, and he was saying he thinks that uh, asset prices, where they are right now, uh, will halve in value in the years ahead. Um, and, uh, and that's going to create its own problems. It, it will help younger people because then they can buy assets a lot cheaper. Uh, but it, it's going to uh, put a lot of strain on those retirees. But uh, one of the big things that's put a lot of pressure on retirees and why they've had to go into risk assets, why they've bought so much property and, and shares and bonds and other other um, assets, 
is because central banks have lowered interest rates so low. Uh, once upon a time, what was it? Uh, what was it? Uh, just just over ten years, just before the global financial crisis, um, you know, someone uh, that wanted to earn fifty thousand dollars a year in interest uh, only needed just over eight hundred thousand dollars, where today they need more like eight million dollars. Uh, and so what we're finding is a lot of older people, uh, instead of uh, uh, enjoying retirement, they're saving more. So they're not spending more because they're getting less return on their savings and they're being forced to go into riskier assets. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I thought this was a fascinating uh, article that I wanted to share with you. Um, remember to stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to record my investment thesis. So I'm going to discuss where I see uh, you know, the macro uh, economics playing out in the near future um, and how I'm positioning my portfolio, uh, the sectors that I'm invested in, why I'm invested in them. And uh, so you'll get a much clearer picture of why I'm uh, investing the way I am. Wayne Gretzky says that uh, you don't skate to the puck, you skate to where the puck is going to be. And so my thesis comes down to where I think the macro is going to be, not today, but uh, just around the corner. And so I plan to build my portfolio around where I think that thesis is going to play out. And, um, and so I'm going to do this in probably a two-part video. I'll start recording it tomorrow. I'll probably release the first part one video um, on, um, so when I mean tomorrow, I mean uh, Friday, which is probably when you're seeing this video. Um, and I'll release part one on Monday next week, probably part two on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. So stay tuned to that because uh, you, you're going to get uh, Detailed. So a lot of a lot of people uh, have asked me, uh, have reached out to me with these videos. Is Steve? It's great that you're giving a lot of uh, economic stuff, a lot of market update stuff, um, reading some really good articles. Uh, but can you give us more practical things that we can maybe go away and implement, or maybe we can think about things for for ourselves and and go into a little bit more detail? So I'm actually going to, um, as I said, share with you. Uh, go into a lot more detail, share with you my macro thoughts. And obviously you'll see because of my macro thoughts, how I've built my portfolio and how I can am continuing to build uh, that portfolio moving out. So, uh, so stay tuned to that one. That'll come out next week, two part video. Uh, anyway, thanks everyone for joining me on this episode of Finance Uncut and I'll see you next time.